Welcome to Inpatient Assessment for Heart or Lung Transplant. We have a team of 10 coordinators. You will meet some, but not all, of the coordinators during your inpatient assessment. By now, you would have already attended our outpatient assessment clinic. We have observed that your trajectory of heart or lung failure is on a downward trend and that you meet criteria to be assessed for your suitability to go onto the transplant waiting list. At this stage, we are not only interested in your heart or lung function, but of your other organ functions too. We need reassurance that there is nothing that could increase your risk whilst having a transplant or hinder your recovery post-transplant. We carry out a four-day inpatient stay, the schedule of which is attached to your letter. You will be admitted either to our day case unit or to one of our cardiology or cardiothoracic wards, depending on your clinical needs. Throughout this week, we will complete a selection of tests and investigations. We will explain each test in more detail throughout the course of this video. We present your case in our transplant assessment, MDT, which takes place on a Thursday morning. We will then deliver the outcome from this meeting to you in person. You may be able to go home after discussing your outcome. However, there is a possibility that our assessment indicates that the safest option would be to keep you as an inpatient for immediate treatment. We will take a large number of samples of blood from your arm. Please be aware we will take up to 14 bottles. The bloods are sent to a lab where the following tests are performed. First, a simple blood test is performed to determine your blood type. This is how your blood type should be compatible with your potential donor's blood type. If you are blood type A, your donor should have blood type A or O. If you are blood type B, your donor should have blood type B or O. If you are blood type O, the donor must have blood type O. A person with blood type O is called a universal donor because he or she can donate to someone of all blood types. If you have blood type AB, universal acceptor, your donor can have blood type AB, A, B or O. You will undergo full serology and virology screening in order to identify any transmissible diseases. Also, all donors are carefully screened to prevent any transmissible diseases or other complications. These blood tests will also test your kidney, liver and bone function. We will test your full blood count and your inflammatory markers. We will complete an abdominal ultrasound scan, which is a non-invasive test, to assess the kidneys, liver, gallbladder, bile ducts, pancreas, spleen and abdominal aorta. This is to check that these organs are working as they should be and that there are no abnormalities seen. If we do observe an abnormality, this is likely to delay our decision making. Most commonly, we would see small nodules or cysts. These are often benign and unharmful. However, we will need to carry out further imaging to ensure that this is the case. We will of course communicate the need for any additional tests and the rationale to you following our discussion at our meeting. We ask that you only have clear fluids from midnight before the procedure in the morning. This is to ensure we obtain good quality images during the scan. This procedure is to assess how well your heart is working. This procedure usually lasts about 30 minutes. Before the procedure, you will be asked to change into a hospital gown. The procedure takes place in the cardiac catheterization lab. There will be a doctor, nurses and a radiographer present. X-ray equipment is used to help the doctor place the catheter in the proper place in your body. The doctor will place a thin plastic tube, known as a catheter, into a large vein in your neck. You should feel pressure at the site, however as local anaesthetic is used, you should not feel a sharp pain. 
We carry out this procedure to measure the pressure in your heart and lungs. It is a useful tool to assess how well your heart and lungs are working. For our heart transplant patients, it is an essential tool to assess whether heart transplant is a safe treatment option or if we need to explore the possibility of an LVAD implant, which we will talk about in more detail later in the video. For our lung transplant patients, this procedure assists us in deciding the most appropriate operation for you, a single lung transplant or a double lung transplant. You will be consented prior to the procedure so that you understand any potential risks and complications. You can have a light diet and fluids until you are taken for the procedure. Your vital signs are monitored for a short time afterwards and you can usually eat and drink straight away. The results of this procedure will be reviewed at the transplant assessment meeting and then discussed with you and your next of kin. CPEC stands for cardiopulmonary exercise testing. This is an objective assessment of functional limitation and prognosis and is valuable in determining candidacy for cardiac transplantation. This is to assess your exercise tolerance to give us insight into your physical limitations. We use an exercise bike rather than a treadmill. It is carried out by an experienced physiologist. You will wear a tight-fitting mask and your vital signs will be monitored throughout to maintain your safety. It takes approximately 30 minutes. We understand your limitations and only ask you to work to your body's ability. This is a type of ultrasound scan, which means a probe is used to send out high frequency sound waves when they bounce off different parts of the body. You'll be asked to remove any clothing covering your upper half before lying down on a bed. You may be offered a hospital gown to cover yourself during the test. When you're lying down, several small sticky sensors called electrodes will be attached to your chest. These will be connected to a machine that monitors your heart rhythm during the test. A lubricating gel will be applied to your chest or directly to the ultrasound probe. You'll be asked to lie on your side and the probe will be moved across your chest. The probe is attached by a cable to a nearby machine that will display and record the images produced. You will not hear the sound waves produced by the probe, but you may hear a swishing noise during the scan. This is normal and is just the sound of the blood flow through your heart being picked up by the probe. The whole procedure will usually take 45 to 60 minutes. An echocardiogram can help diagnose and monitor certain heart conditions by checking the structure of the heart and surrounding blood vessels, analysing how blood flows through them and assessing the pumping chambers of the heart. An electrocardiogram or ECG is a test which measures the electrical activity of your heart. Sensors attached to the skin are used to detect the electrical signals produced by your heart each time it beats. These signals are recorded by a machine and we will review this in our meeting to see if they are unusual. Generally the test involves attaching a number of small sticky sensors called electrodes to your arms, legs and chest. These are connected by wires to an ECG recording machine. You don't need to do anything special to prepare for the test. You can eat and drink as normal beforehand. Before the electrodes are attached, you'll usually need to remove your upper clothing and your chest may need to be shaved or cleaned. Once the electrodes are in place, you may be offered a hospital gown to cover yourself. The test itself usually only lasts a few minutes. Pulmonary function tests, or PFTs, are non-invasive tests that show how well the lungs are working. The tests measure lung volume, capacity, rates of flow and gas exchange. 
you will have completed this test before your inpatient assessment. We will repeat this unless it has been completed within two months. This is a useful tool in order to assess the trajectory of your lung failure and whether or not listing for transplant is the right decision for you. We will measure how much air you can take into your lungs, how quickly you can blow air out of your lungs, how well your lungs can take up oxygen and the strength of your breathing muscles. Your results are compared to what they should be using predicted values. These values are based on what would be expected in healthy people of your age, height, gender and ethnicity. If we deem you a suitable candidate to be listed for a lung transplant, we would not routinely repeat your lung function whilst you are on the waiting list. This is a useful tool in order to assess your exercise tolerance and core strength. It also provides useful information about your lung levels and heart rate whilst you exercise. It is common for patients with lung failure to tend to reduce their physical activity due to unpleasant symptoms of breathlessness and fatigue. However, it is essential that you are fit enough to withstand the transplant operation. We will complete the walk on a flat surface. We will monitor your oxygen levels and heart rate throughout the test. We measure the distance walked by metres. You can stop if you need to, but the timer will continue. We ask that you do not talk during the walk so to preserve your energy. We ask that you use the same oxygen requirements that you would use at home when mobilising. If you are listed for a transplant, the test will be repeated on every tracking visit with the transplant team to assess your core strength. If we feel that your walking distance has fallen significantly, we would consider suspending you on the waiting list until you have engaged in pulmonary rehabilitation. You should have already received two questionnaires that will help us to assess your emotional well-being. One of these questionnaires will ask about your mood, primarily anxiety and depression, whilst the other will ask more about your general quality of life. We know that when people have experienced health deterioration over some time or have previously been fit and well and have then been given a life-changing diagnosis, it's not uncommon to experience difficulties with adjustment, low mood or anxiety. We are interested in how you and your family are coping with these changes to your health and the process of undergoing assessment for transplantation. This is so that we can provide you with, or refer you for, any psychological support you may need. And it will also help the team to know how best to support you as you go through this process. The information you provide will be reviewed by the transplant coordinators. We may recommend that you meet with our transplant psychologist for a more in-depth assessment. This is likely to happen if you have experienced any difficulties in the past in relation to depression, anxiety, or any other mental health disorders as we know how important it is to support you as best we can. It is essential that we carry out a thorough consultation with you and your family. It is up to you who is present for this discussion, though it is mandatory that at least one key person is in attendance. This talk enables us to inform you of the risks and benefits of transplantation and of the commitments necessary from you in order to achieve a successful outcome post-transplantation. We will talk you and your loved ones through the whole transplant journey in order to try and prepare you for what lies ahead. We will discuss the transplant operation, including the risks and complications associated with this. We also discuss your intensive care stay, rehabilitation, psychology, education, the structure of our waiting lists, and if you are a heart transplant assessment patient, the possibility of needing a left ventricular assist device implanted. 
This is a useful tool for us to assess your social support so that we are reassured you will be well supported and cared for in the community in the immediate post-discharge phase. Practically, it helps us to guide you into preparing for the practical side of living on the transplant waiting list. Most importantly, who will be able to provide transport at the point of a donor offer? It is helpful to highlight any potential issues regarding family support at this early stage. This way, discussions can be held with those closest to you in order to formulate a plan of action for the future. It helps us to highlight any psychological history or concerns. You are more than welcome to visit any of the areas that you may be cared for in order to see them and meet the staff. This includes wards 304, 306, coronary care unit and intensive care. We usually schedule these talks for Wednesday, but we are flexible and happy to work around your loved one's schedules. The talk usually takes an hour to an hour and a half. If from the assessment investigations we deem that you are not a currently a suitable candidate for heart transplantation, we may be able to give you the option of a left ventricular assist device or LVAD. This will be because your pulmonary pressures are elevated, making transplantation an unsafe option. An LVAD is a mechanical pump that supports the function of the left ventricle of your heart and therefore will only be an option if your right ventricle is working effectively. The LVAD pumps oxygen-rich blood from the left ventricle of your heart to the rest of your body. This device is used as a bridge to transplantation and we will reassess your suitability for heart transplantation approximately six months after the implant of the LVAD. A repeat right heart catheter is performed to reassess your pulmonary artery pressures to help determine whether you meet the criteria to be listed for heart transplantation. If the pulmonary artery pressures have reduced to an adequate level, and we have observed no other contraindications to transplant, we would then offer you routine listing for heart transplant. Having an LVAD inserted involves having open heart surgery and the use of heart-lung bypass machine. As with any operation, LVAD implant does come with an element of risk and your surgeon will explain these risks to you before you sign the operation consent form. The LVAD is attached to the base of the left ventricle of your heart and it pumps blood to the rest of your body via the aorta. The drive line, which is an insulated wire attached to the pump, is guided through your chest and out through the left side of your abdomen. This drive line will permanently protrude from your abdomen and you and your next of kin will be taught how to manage the drive line exit site by applying sterile dressings. This is a vital part of day-to-day -day life with an LVAD. The drive line exit site must be looked after in order to reduce the chances of an infection occurring. The drive line is then connected to a system controller, which in turn is connected to two rechargeable batteries or mains power electricity to provide the pump with the power to work. The system controller and batteries together weigh approximately two kilograms and can be worn on a belt around your waist or in a shoulder bag. At night, you connect the system controller to mains power electricity and recharge the batteries. Whilst you have an LVAD, you need to take an anticoagulant medicine called warfarin. This drug thins your blood to reduce the risk of blood clots forming in the pump. You will also undergo a rigorous teaching programme in order to prepare you and your family for life at home with an LVAD. You will not be discharged home until you have been deemed competent in caring for the LVAD and associated equipment and you feel confident to do so. It is important to note that once the LVAD is implanted, you will not be able to have a bath, go swimming, undertake water sports or contact sports. You will also not be able to shower for the first few months post-implant. Once discharged, you will be seen regularly in the LVAD outpatient follow-up clinic here in Birmingham, in addition to attending cardiac rehabilitation classes locally to your home. As you adjust to life with an LVAD, you should notice that your previous heart failure symptoms subside, your exercise tolerance increases and your quality of life improves. <laughs>